All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? So uh, first off, thank you all for indulging me. I've wanted to interview my mom for a long time. Um, the great inspiration in my life uh, as an entrepreneur. And I think she sort of, um, in hindsight, realized that she kind of raised me to be an entrepreneur. When I was a kid, she used to, I earned my allowance by um, working for her company to deliver sodas. And my dad, who's over here, um, would drive me to the supermarket to buy the sodas. And then I'd buy them for $4 and she would pay me nine for them. So just really, she, thank you mom for getting, let me rip you off like that. And uh, um, that was, I believe her way to not have to pay taxes on my allowance. <laughs> so um, uh, my mom is a, um, not only is she uh, my mom and done a, I, I think from my perspective, a great job of raising me, but um, she's also a really, impressive business person. She started her first company in 1977. Did I get that right? 79? 80? I don't know. 1980, excuse me. Same year, around the time I was born. Um, she is a biochemist. We'll go into a little bit of her bio, uh, biography but, and let her tell the story a bit better than me. But she uh, was, is a biochemist. She worked under the Dr. Krebs, if I remember correctly, Krebs Cycle. Some of you remember from chemistry. That was when she was a uh, scientist, worked for him and uh, went into the world of business. What is it, mom, that led you become a go from academia? You always consider yourself a scientist, I think, but what led you go from academia into being an entrepreneur and starting a company? I do consider myself to be a biochemist and very much have used science in my business the whole time. Um, but it was kind of a fluke that I went because I had worked in graduate school part-time for EPA doing basic toxicology reviews. And in the process, I noticed that the way they were doing their risk assessments was just flat out wrong. There was good data and they were making assumptions that didn't uh, that couldn't be really supported. And I said something and nobody paid any attention. But I went off actually right after Ryan was born and when I, I got a call from somebody at EPA because they had gotten in trouble because someone had realized that their fundamental assumptions weren't supportable. What are we talking about risk of? Of exposure to pesticides basically. And so they asked if I would like to come back and fix their system because I had worked before that at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and knew where the data were that we needed to use because it wasn't rocket science and it wasn't reinventing the wheel. Um, and so I said, yes, I was without a job and I thought that would be good. But there was a hiring freeze and so they couldn't hire me, it turned out. And they asked if I'd work under contract and I said, yes. And that turned out to be a great way to do a long-term hard project because you couldn't be diverted into today's fire. Yeah, you know, they just couldn't do that without a contract. And I would never have gotten to finish that project otherwise. And so by then other clients were calling me and the rest is history. Yeah, and, so, and um, that, that company was called uh, Technical Assessment Systems, TAS. Yes, and that- Where'd you come up with the name? Well, that was interesting. I had a business, now it doesn't sound very interesting, but in fact, it was a play on the name of the system that I had developed under contract for EPA. And so it caused people to get confused of whether they were talking about the EPA system or our company. And it got us really instant visibility and uh, let us get running and grow and uh, go from there. And, and so she grew, you grew this that business. That was not my idea. That was a partner's idea. Um, you grew this business until, when did you sell TAS? You sold it when I was in high school. 1990. 95 so it was like a 15 year run and she had an office that was about this size I remember when I was in high school and when I was delivering sodas yeah. for you. We were not a large office um, and at that time interestingly enough it was very very hard to get operating cash and to they didn't make loans to little companies and they couldn't understand what we did and what our line of business and profits were. Um, and maybe it was a little bit because it was a woman-owned company, but I think it was also they just didn't understand our business. We were new to that uh, stream, and the banks were the main funders at that point. So, so we were slow growing. We were also uh, doing something which required really specialized expertise along the way. Yeah, you had how many PhDs working at TAS? Uh, probably 90% uh, of the staff were PhDs. Um, and so then the 
you, you sold the business and had a one year or was it one year non solicit where you couldn't hire any of the employees? Actually, we ended up not that not being a problem. We, we hired as quickly as we could and as quickly as we could bring clients. And I was very lucky. It, the selling the business was actually a dispute, an unresolvable dispute with a partner, um, which was not pleasant. I don't wish it on anyone, but we got through it. And I think I ended up with most of the employees. And I ended up with them because I was able always to clearly explain what we needed from them. And I say I, and it's the royal I, because we had a whole team. But as they had to decide, do I stay, do I go, what am I going to do, they could see what their role would be and that they would be recognized and have the opportunity to do that. And I ended up with virtually probably 80% of the staff decided to take a chance on this new fledgling business and come. And they really were the secret to it succeeding. And um, so that, that company was called uh, Novagen Sciences, better name in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and uh, she started this when I was in high school. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell this part of the story because I remember this is still a big driver for me. First off, I saw the dispute with your partner and that was ugly. So I started Flexport without any partners to eliminate that risk. Uh, uh, I won't, can't get in a fight with myself. <laughs> Not too bad. Um, then... Um, I watched her in one year, and this was around 1997, I was like a junior in high school, start a new company that kind of competed with the old one after this falling out that you had with the partner. And for one year, you didn't hire a lot of staff. It was like you on your own for that first six, 12 months. I don't know if you remember, but you were working 16 hour days every day. It was a busy time. It was crazy watching her work that hard and see like, and still be there a good mom credit to my dad who would cook dinner for us every night so that she could work as hard as she did. And also for writing a lot of the software that her uh, team needed. So it was a, definitely a partnership. Um, uh, but my mom learned how to manage people, how to scale, how to really grow that business. It was super impressive to watch. What are some, um, and the, a big theme for the business was helping companies deal with international, with regulatory, uh, the regulatory environment, helping companies deal with compliance, with food safety in particular, compliance. Um, what are And a lot of that was international disputes. It's an interesting time because we have trade wars and tariff disputes and all these um, interesting regulatory times. What are some things like, we think this is like a new phenomenon, but you've been involved in international trade disputes since decades. From the, from the very beginning, really. And I might come back to, to talk about Steve for a second because one of the reasons we could succeed on a thread threadbare financing and um, to attract big company clients when we didn't have a real reputation was that he was at the forefront of developing software for using on the PC and for starting for us the tools to use that nobody else had to do a really good risk assessment. Um, and we've provided that software in the beginning to EPA and to FDA for, for their use and their both agencies are still using it uh, because ultimately you need good, solid data to underline it. But some of the very first projects we worked on were the, the kind of the beginning of regulating food safety on a worldwide basis. Um, and it was at the time that the World Trade Organization was beginning to get power and they were trying to figure out how do you see with what was done in the US, if you want to export that to Europe, is it meet our, food, our European food standards? We did a lot of work for European committees to line up their foods. And I can remember spending hours and hours and hours on debates on how you define what's a bread and what's a pastry. And you say, why do you care? Well, the food laws in most countries require breads to be fortified with the essential nutrients because we had around the turn of the 1900s big problems of nutritional deficiencies with people eating white breads and not getting enough of the B vitamins. Um, and so they did that, but pastries are forbidden to be 
fortified. So you really need to decide where a croissant belongs. Is it a bread? Or you don't know how to enforce the regulations at the border and do this. What is the French chicken problem? You said you were going to talk about that, and I don't even know what you're talking about. Okay, well, <laughs> um, it's been, it's interesting because it's been back in the news in um, recent days, I've seen it. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know when that actually started. I'm going to say 1970. It may have been later. But the U.S. has gotten, by this time, very efficient at raising chickens. We just, we're down to pennies per pound in growing a chicken, and everybody else is spending 10 times what we are. So our manufacturers and growers see a huge market in Europe to ship frozen chickens to Europe. Um, and I call it the French chicken wars, but I think it was more than France, really. Um, it just kind of came to a head there. And they didn't want our chickens because they couldn't economically do this. But they, they laid a food safety criteria because under the WTO, you're not supposed to do it on price. You're supposed to do, you can keep things out because it doesn't meet your safety regulations. So they claimed it had... Um, hormones or antibiotics or things they didn't allow in the chicken, which we have never solved that. We still don't ship frozen chicken to them. But uh, in retaliation, um, of course, it wasn't retaliation. It was food safety. The U.S. <laughs> the U.S. didn't let the French Beaujolais, is that how you say it? The, the fresh wines that have to be consumed right away the first year. you not letting them age for years. And we kept that out because they had unapproved pesticides in it. I say we, meaning the U.S. Um, and that was really our, as a company, first opportunity to do something for a Japanese client it's because the, quote, illegal pesticides were Japanese, well, manufactured by a Japanese company. And we got the contract to oversee the field growing of grapes in Europe to, to get the approvals um, in both countries for um, these pesticides. And it would probably never have happened if it hadn't been a crisis and needed to be done right away. And that gave me and the other people at um, TAS and Novagen, because it went on for a number of years, um, introduction to a Japanese client, and that led to long-term work for a number of Japanese clients. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I, I went on one of these trips. I've been on a, my mom used to take me on a lot of the business trips. I'm super lucky. Uh, and what I remember hearing you talk a little bit about how difficult it was to do business in Japan as a woman, as if th where they would only insist on meeting the head of the company, but refuse to meet with a woman. With a woman. Um, so we had a real problem because we didn't have a backup for that. <laughs> I, you know, and I think it brought to me how important it is when you're doing business in a different country to understand as much as you can about their culture and to decide how much of that culture you want to take on as a principal. I mean, there are times when you would really like to say, look, give it up. You know, it's time to deal with a woman. But there are other times when you would really recognize, look, I can solve their business issue, not their cultural issue. But you have to recognize that it is one or the other. And with that client, we kind of worked out they would come to the U.S. and they could meet with me in the U.S. in my office. And that didn't shame them back home that they were working with a woman. And I could send a vice president to Japan and, you know, we'd make up some excuse why the owner didn't come and we'd kind of work around. And interestingly enough, a very senior Japanese woman was involved in this. And she could come, and she spoke good English, and she could come to the U.S. and be involved in the negotiations. And when we went to Japan, she served tea in the room. They still had her there. They wanted her in the room to hear the English and to follow what was going. But culturally, we were really stuck. Was that the hardest place that you found to do business as a woman? No, it wasn't. Uh, but just on Japan a little bit more, as we worked through things, then we got the opportunity to work for Sumitomo, which is the biggest pesticide manufacturer. And they were interviewing various consulting firms and sent a very senior team to Washington. And part of the culture piece that fortunately we had read about, but we had a really hard time learning how to do, 
they came and we made a presentation and they talked and you sit there and there are long periods of silence, you know, for Americans, we're just not used to, I talk and then I stop and the other side thinks and then they talk. And, you know, at one point the senior guy, we had given our presentation and it's very quiet and we're sitting there for what seems like 15 minutes. It's probably two or three minutes. And we're kind of up on the edge of our seat. And we're expecting he's going to say, you got the business or you didn't or something really important. And finally, the most senior guy looks up and he says, where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Four people jumped up from the table to show him the bathroom. <laughs> but we got the contract and it went on to be a very good, very fruitful interaction. And they eventually have learned and women from the group go to Japan every year now for the presentation. So you have seen some cultural change there. I've seen cultural change, um, but I think the same thing in Europe. They, they don't. They need a period of getting to know you um, much more than we do. But in both cases, in all those cases, I think that that period of getting to know your customer is very helpful. And the more time you spend on that, the less time you'll spend fixing mistakes down the road. Did you protect, were you able to absorb a lot of this and protect your team from it? I mean, your team was mostly female, or at least in my memory, they had a lot of senior women on the team. Were you protecting them from that and being like, not, did they know about it? Were you have, were people? I think we're, yes, I think we were all aware of it. And I think you don't take it personally. It's a cultural oh. way of doing things down the road. But I also think, from a trade standpoint, we've always been at that interface of compliance um, and the safety, and we're not in the marketplace. Our job's not to help you sell, you the client, to sell products. It's to help you make sure you understand the regulations and you comply with them. And some countries do a better job of that than others down the road. And I think in the long run, compliance is huge, and that's that's really where our team excelled because we would figure out what regulators in different countries need to know about your product in order to feel that it's safe and viable and that you get the approvals you need. Um, we have members of our compliance team in the front row, Mom. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Can you give some advice? I mean, we're a heavily regulated industry. It deals with actually some of the same regulations that you're often sending me articles about food regulations and trade and stuff what what advice do you have for those of us that where we deal with regulated with the regulators and being more compliant well i think you have to figure out a way to know your regulators um and to know the vulnerabilities and we did a lot of work for american toy companies i don't know 15 years ago or so when their products got it out of compliance first with the california proposition 65 rules uh, That's the one that around lead, right? This was lead and, and it, it led in children's <laughs> products, um, which is a huge concern. You, nobody wants to give their child a toy that's got lead in it. And everybody, nobody could figure out where it's there and why it's not there. Um, and then the levels were sufficiently high that they were actually out of compliance with the federal. That ends up being probably FTC more than FDA, but because FDA is the acknowledged expert on lead, um, lead exposure, lead control, lead compliance, they were very much involved. Um, and I, I, I went with a team, but we spent a lot of time in China trying to figure out where is it coming from, why is it there? Um, and I came back from that saying, okay, we, the American manufacturers, have set specifications that basically ensure cheating. We want this bright red color. We want it to stick this well to the toy. We don't, you know, there were all these things. And in one case, they had 170 different colors of brown that were allowed to be used that their toy designers were picking from, which meant that the manufacturers in China were buying paint by the port by the pint. Well, nobody can afford to do a lead test that costs $25 on a $5 can of paint or a $2 can of paint. So I think you were just encouraging cheating. And um, you could say, well, the, 
the regulations were in compliance, but you couldn't do the monitoring you needed to do to make sure. How did they fix that? Or is there lead in paint children's toys today? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I think it was funny because we spent 10 days from one company there and we really went around and we designed a testing program where we combined things. So you would test all the brown paints together and mm -hmm. do it and things like that. And, but we were in a closed room like one of yours downstairs and we had post-its all over the wall and we had reached an agreement. And I came back and there were two guys who turned out to be accountants for the company up there going down the list and chatting like crazy in Chinese. And I asked what they were doing and they were actually quantifying what it was going to cost and having a fit. So I, I do think we solved it for the time being. Did it stay solved? I don't know. You know, you hope so. But, but there's no point in putting something in place that you don't have an effective control mechanism because it's not going to work. Um, I, one of my, I remember you did the, um, one of the fast food companies, one of the projects that you did that I thought was curious and or really interesting and, a, and an example of a real entrepreneurial spirit was where you went and you did the menu for one of the biggest fast food companies in the world where they're required to do calories uh, and show them. And she's the one that calculated how many calories are actually in a cheeseburger. Can you talk about how you did that? Because it was a super impressive, very scrappy, from my perspective as an entrepreneur, I had respect for how you actually figured out how many calories were in all the food items. Part of the reason people came to us is that we were a little company and we would tackle things that they didn't know how to do or that they needed the, frankly, uh, a layer in between because they couldn't send a shopper out to pick up product. And we we did it both at the beginning of Prop 65 and in this case for a large fast food company uh, where we sent people to the store to pick up the products and then send them by overnight to the laboratory and we supervised the labs. And in this case, we were actually looking at the time of the trans fat analysis and trying to get an idea um, trans fat levels get higher as the uh, cooking oil is used for more days. And so the question was, what are our manu managers, how often are they changing the oils and um, are they controlling temperatures? So we needed to go to some pretty remote places because those were more likely to be the ones where they weren't changing it out. If you're downtown San Francisco, you're selling so much product that it turns over a lot faster. Um, so we went to Craigslist and we advertised and we got shoppers in these little towns and we figured out how to train them online and get the shipping materials to them, get the product back. It's the weirdest Craigslist ad anyone has ever run. Please go to the fast food, buy a hamburger and FedEx it to me. Yeah. <laughs> People took it up. <laughs> People did it. So. Um. Where, um, I, w one of the areas that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was around your um, mentorship. You had a number of people on your team, or you were, you were a mentor, of course, to lots of your employees. Uh, some of them, many of them followed you when you switched uh, companies. Some, a lot of them you're still in touch with as they've moved on in their careers. But what about mentors? They still work for us. What's that? What about, don't you have some, you had some mentors yourself, some folks that, mentored you or helped you in your career because you weren't really setting out to start companies. It kind of happened to you. That's true. And I ended up with in particular two men on my, I called them my advisory board. I'm not a publicly traded company. I didn't have to have a board of directors, but I had the opportunity to hire two people. I say hire, but to recruit and get them to be on my board. I didn't have to follow what they the advice they gave, uh, but I tried to really listen to them. Um, one of them had just retired as the head of the International Division for Campbell Soup. His name was Bud, and I had, he, I had been a client, our company had been a client for them through all of the uh, Prop 65 cases there, and so um, when he retired, he was kind of at loose ends, and I was working with him on a professional society, and I asked him to come. And fortuitously, about the same time, um, a, an employee saw when I was having this disagreement with my partner, the problems, and suggested his father-in-law um, 
as who had been a career investment banker for Alex Brown in Baltimore. And he was in his 70s and really tailing off. And he agreed to come and help us have a divorce here and to get going. And they both stayed with me and it was a huge help. And they brought to problems completely different perspectives because Bud had worked for one of the largest food companies in the world. And when we would do a business plan for the next year and I would show 10% growth, he, he would say, that's a million cans of soup. You can't grow that fast. And Alex Brown would look at it, you know, and say, that's one bloody contract. Come on, be more, more adventuresome in what you're doing. And so they brought very different perspectives. And they also were very quick and had different ways of thinking about how you mentor a team and how you grow. And I think we really benefited from both. And the staff went to them directly and asked questions too. And they introduced us to all kinds of clients and potential clients. And uh, how do you solve a problem? You know, Campbell's Soup has gone into Argentina and they've got into Guatemala. And when we would get into issues there, they knew people we could go and talk to. Because ultimately, one of the tricks of all of this is knowing your regulators and being able to pick up the phone and talk to them. How do you get to know their regulators? Well, you work at it. You find out what professional societies they're in. You go in and you talk. You, you spend time. And it is time consuming. But ultimately, they, in a way, they can't do on a formal submission. You can start to learn why petitions are not moving through. or because. You, you need to be on the same side of the issues they are, and particularly in food safety. I want to be able to say when we have a problem, how quickly can we get to the point that FDA and we agree on a solution? Because it's nobody's best interest to have unsafe food out there. And their issues will be different from those of the company a lot of times. They don't, they don't want to get that call um, on a product on July 3rd at 5 p.m. and they have to spend the whole weekend trying to figure out why that lettuce is making somebody sick or what can be done about it. So when you say you call a regulator, you mean the actual person, the individual, you'd have their phone number who works at that and you say, hey. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, you may not, you may know way more people than you're calling when you know you've got a food safety problem. And I'm at the stage of my career now where I make a lot of those calls where I get to say, guess what we did this time? Um, you know, because we've been around the circles. But um, yes, and they appreciate the heads up and they know, they know, they've been working on this in most cases for 30 years. And so they've been there and they know what you can do. And, um, yeah, with, I don't know if we spend enough time with that, that actual building personal relationships. It's time consuming. It really, it is. And, and it's understanding because you'll, a petition, we do a lot of work on uh, petitions for new food additives or new pesticides or new uses or, or re-review of these and something won't be moving. And you know, it's nice for everybody to grumble about the lazy regulators and everything. But if you really listen, a lot of times it's not moving because there's somebody there that's seen something. It may not, it may not fit in the check boxes, but they're worried about something. And if you listen long enough, um, you'll, you, then you can go do the study. We do a lot of designing new studies and you can figure out why, why it's not moving and you can solve their concern. And it can be your concern too when you realize how they're looking at it. Um, I, which is something else I would say, which I'm not doing today, but you know, is spend a lot of time listening, um, asking questions, listening. As kids, what would what be advice for parents raising kids in this environment where you can't let your kid drive to no. 2,000 miles by themselves when they're 14? The world, the world <laughs> has certainly changed. I'm not sure that was a good idea there, maybe. Uh, yeah, my dad was a farmer. I was, I was, in a way, I was given a ton of freedom like that. But on the other hand, I was raised in a tiny town. I had my grandmother for a third grade teacher, my parents for school teachers, um, and everybody in town 
really was watching every kid, I think, and that's changed. Um, but I, I think now we, we err on the other side as every, I see parents in my neighborhood out of the school bus stop with the 14 year olds. And then when they're 16, they get their driver's license and they can go anywhere. Yeah. So, I, but I do think some freedom is really, is really needed and certainly reliance and being able to do things on your own. What about any lessons that like you saw your parents do that you deliberately didn't do with David and I? <laughs> well, I have some of those from, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think the biggest one on that that I would say is my father was a child of the Depression. He grew up in Lodi and they raised grapes there, um, sold them to Gallo actually. Um, and the farm is still there and still raising grapes. I don't know if they've upgraded their grape stock, but um, as a result of having gone through the Depression and they lost one farm during that, he was, could not take risks and spend money. And in order to have a successful business, you really have to learn to spend money and to get behind it when there's a mistake. But to, you know, to be rigorous about... Don't tell this, them to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to spend money to make money. But you also have to be... And this was something we got brought into with clients, is you really have to be rigorous in recognizing when something's not working and even though you've invested heavily in it and people is not regarded as career breaking for somebody when they say oh look i had this idea and we've spent money but it's not working we've got to go back and we used to get brought in a lot of times for clients even big big companies would have what we call kind of gate and stoplight systems that you know you start developing maybe a new pesticide and you get to this point and you look at the safety data and you say, do we keep going? Is, can this be registered? Is there a market for it? And what you found is very early in that process, people's careers were staked on it. So nobody could say no. So they say, okay, let's do the next phase of studies. Well, we had spent 2 million and now we spent 10 million. Do you think it gets easier to say no at that point? And so a lot of times we'd get brought in because we were an outside company and they could all be mad at us and we could go back to the office and they could stop the project and give up. Because maybe, you know, we had one that um, was a very good pesticide to kill mosquitoes, but it was clearly never gonna pass the environmental fate criteria for EPA. So once it was registered, it, you couldn't use it near water. Well, you can't kill mosquitoes if you can't use this near water. So you, you kind of work through them. You, you've worked in, um, you, you sold Novagen to a publicly traded company. It still goes on. As the, you're the food and chemicals division of Exponent, which is a public company here in Menlo Park. What, um, what was the biggest difference between being a startup and an entrepreneurial company that you ran versus working for a big public company? I, I think they really have a hard time with an entrepreneurial environment because they need to make sure that stock price doesn't go down because <laughs> That's number one for them. Um, and I think they, they've probably missed markets that we would have gone after, but they had the cash flow and we didn't to move into China. Their stock price has done quite well though, so we can't too criticize oh, yeah, it. yeah, because they're religious about it. <laughs> they make sure that they don't take risks that you're gonna have to shut off down the road. Uh, so there's stability with a big company. There's cash, solves a lot of the cash flow issues. Um, I think it helps with recruiting in a lot of ways, but they, they don't do that excitement of, oh, let's go try this new opportunity. Mm. Let's go uh, lease some 747s and see if we can find somebody to let us ship <laughs> product. <out. laughs> That's not- We still got that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, you guys get frustrated, I'm sure with it, but there's real opportunity and real excitement in trying something brand new, looking for a new market, going after it. Um, well, we have uh, probably a little time. I'm, I'm kind of nervous of what questions people are going to ask, to be honest, but we could, we should try that. Is there a, is there a throw mic? Um, yeah, we can pass one of these. I don't need to answer. Question? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Which of your son's businesses do you find more interesting? 
David's here. Um, I think they're both amazing. I think the piece I've watched with both of them is this idea that, and it really it fits with mine too, is we did the hard things to try to keep competitors at bay, but you have to keep reinventing because the people are gonna catch up with you. And I think David probably more than, than Ryan will talk about, you really get something going and it's really creative, completely new. And then you've got to be thinking of the next thing because there's somebody else out there nipping at your heels trying to get there. And the internet has really made some of that easier. It's lowered the barriers to entry, so you have to look. We, we created for EPA a system of breaking food consumption data down that nobody's duplicated yet. Um, so that's been very helpful for us working through things. Uh, hi, Darren McGee. I've got a question. Uh, you've raised not just one, but two entrepreneurs. Uh, as a person with two young kids at home, I'm curious, what is it that you did on a daily basis uh, to instill the entrepreneurial spirit in your kids? I wasn't trying to do that, but the one thing I was trying to do is instill curiosity. And I don't know if that's what led to it. They probably have a better idea. I did try, Ryan mentioned, I tried to take them with me whenever I could on trips. And several times Steve and I were able to coordinate trips and do things like that. Because I grew up in this tiny town in rural New Mexico. I didn't, when I'm studying history, I didn't even know anybody who'd ever been to these places. So it was all rote memory. And I think once you've been there, it's, there's so much more understanding of what's going on. And I do think the world is a, complete one place now. And so the more we understand about it, the better. I think I'm between you and the party ideas now. <laughs> well, this is great. Thank you for coming, Mom. Oh, thank you for asking. Thank you. And, um, And I'll be out around for a while, so feel free to come talk to us. And, and um, we really should give my, my dad a lot of credit. We'll, maybe we do another one. My dad, uh, he, for, um, we'll be hanging out here, but he wrote, for the engineers in the room, my dad wrote his first, uh, he's a programmer, and he wrote his first software in 1970. Oh, um, trash 80? Yeah, to analyze Soviet defense spending was part of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, I always give him crap because that's for historians in the room, that's five years before Microsoft. So he should have figured out how to make some money. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for coming. For, and um, thank you, Mom. I love you so much. Uh,